What's up everyone, it's Endymion, and today I want to talk about three specific articles from two publications known for their bias when it comes to news coverage. Lately I've been seeing discussions surrounding the concept that Link from The Legend of Zelda could be considered a gay or trans icon. And as I read and dug deeper, I could feel my eyelids closing by force due to the cringe I was subjecting myself to endure. So let's ask a very weird question and see if we can come to a consensus. Is Link from The Legend of Zelda a LGBT icon, and if not, why? Well, let's begin. To start off, I want to look at Polygon with their article titled, Link is a Gay Icon and Zelda Fans Know It. Immediately, this tries to bypass any criticism by claiming that the subject matter is undisputed fact, which of course it isn't. Polygon attempts to strengthen their narrative by saying that Zelda's producer, Eiji Onoma, said Link was originally a gender-neutral character, citing a Times Magazine article where Onoma said, and I quote, Back during the Ocarina of Time days, I wanted Link to be gender-neutral. I wanted the player to think maybe Link is a boy or a girl. If you saw Link as a guy, he'd have more of a feminine touch, or vice versa, if you related to Link as a girl, it was with more of a masculine aspect. I really wanted the designer to encompass more of a gender-neutral figure. So I've always thought that for either female or male players, I wanted them to be able to relate to Link. During the development of Twilight Princess, I went a different route and created a version of Link that was more masculine. But after Twilight Princess, I went back to the drawing board and decided Link should be a more gender-neutral character. Hence, I created the version of Link that you see in Breath of the Wild. As far as gender goes, Link is definitely a male, but I wanted to create a character where anybody would be able to relate to the character. So that's why I think the rumor went around that Link could be a female, because maybe the users were able to relate in that way." End quote. What Anuma says here is really not that surprising coming from Japan, but it doesn't really in any way confirm that Link is gay or trans, like Polygon and other sites claim. With this same mentality, we could argue that Cloud from Final Fantasy VII is also trans or gay because he's an androgynous looking person. But the truth is that Japanese culture just depicts characters like Cloud or Link like this simply because Japanese audiences like unique designs. Final Fantasy especially is well known for having many aesthetically pleasing characters in their roster. Sephiroth, for example, is a towering psychopath with long silver hair and a massive katana. But just because he has long hair doesn't mean he's immediately trans or gay. He's simply a man with long hair whose mom is an alien, but I'm getting off topic. Anyway, one of the major reoccurring talking points I keep seeing when it comes to modern game journalists is that they feel the need to pander to whatever is politically correct. Not only that, but when it comes to those who identify with general identity politics, they have this almost fever-like mentality to force their ideas into everything they see. This brings us to the second article about this topic from the gamer titled, Link is a trans character in whatever way we want them to be. This article especially strengthens my claim that people who are steeped in echo chambers and identity politics feel the need to force their ideas onto things in order to, in a way I guess you could say, co-opt or integrate them to fit their worldviews. TheGamer.com says, and I quote, Link has always been an androgynous reflection of the player, a silent optimistic hero who is destined to save the world and protect Princess Zelda from evildoers that loom over Hyrule. While the character always goes by masculine pronouns and is viewed as a man by all those he stumbles across in each game, Link has often acted in defiance of gender norms. It's the continuation of a vision that began when Breath of the Wild was revealed back in 2014. This trailer was brief, following Link as he looked out upon the sprawling green fields of Hyrule while atop Epona. Suddenly, a guardian springs into frame and chases him through the forest in a scene that deliberately mirrors Studio Ghibli's Princess Mononoke. The final sequence of shots has our hero leaping into the air and removing his hood before firing an arrow at his awaiting enemy. Luscious visuals and fantastic new world put aside, what really stood out was Link himself. Or herself, since there was a notably feminine look to the character that we had never seen before and certainly felt deliberate. This is where it all began, a journey of queer exploration that dared to ask if this coming vision of Zelda would not only flip the gender of this iconic character, but perhaps go even further." End quote. They even share some fan art of Link having what seems to be top surgery, leading to the notion that Link is and can be viewed as a trans character. 
But like Polygon already admitted in their article, Nintendo always had intended Link to be male. This is further solidified by how Link has been presented throughout the years with even cartoons playing to his heterosexuality. At one point during the gamer's article, they claim Link being forced to wear women's clothing in order to infiltrate a women's only town is Nintendo confirming he's trans. And that this depiction of Link somehow strengthens their claim that Link can be and is a gay trans icon. But what the gamer doesn't mention is that this moment in Breath of the Wild is played off as a gag. It's not supposed to be viewed as a legitimate claim to Link's sexuality. It's sort of like in Final Fantasy VII when Cloud needs to cross-dress in order to infiltrate Don Corneo's mansion. This entire sequence is played for comedy and is designed to be ridiculous because it is. Cloud is also very visibly uncomfortable with the entire situation, but the idea of Cloud being a woman is meant to be just that. A funny little one-off moment of brevity amidst a game full of serious subject matter. The same can be said about Link in Wild. He's not dressing up as a woman because he wants to, but it's the only way he can enter the town without getting kicked out. And of course you can keep the clothing after it's used, but it's not needed. It's just that Japanese devs like to put goofy things in their games is all. Just look at Tekken and their ridiculous outfits that you can use, or the Tails games with their little props each character can put on. That's all any of this stuff is. It's all just a costume or joke for a single part of an experience until it's served its purpose and the game's story can resume. I wouldn't say Cloud is anywhere close to being trans or gay because he dresses up. He does that in order to save two people he cares about, but by the same logic, Polygon and the gamer would see it as Square Enix confirming Cloud is now a part of their ideology. But in reality, it's just Japan being Japan. They're known for their crude and oftentimes politically incorrect humor. But maybe that's why Japanese media is so popular to begin with, because unlike the West, the Japanese don't care what offends Western people. What annoys me more than anything is this constant push that everything must appeal to or bend the knee to these woke ideological agendas. Everything must be gay or inclusive, have representation, and implement diversity even if it doesn't make any sense. It's also just plain annoying because these gender identity driven westernized individuals feel the need to integrate anything they like to fit their identity. And as you can see from the examples in this video alone, they're even trying to integrate a very popular Japanese franchise like Zelda to fit their ideology. In some ways, what Polygon and the Gamer are doing here is a weird form of cultural appropriation. They see something that was not made with their own worldview in mind and seek to twist it in order to claim it as their own. We see this all the time with movies or any entertainment medium really, with terms like these villains are queer coded as if the only way they can like a character is if the character shares the same sexuality or identity as they do. Eiji Onoma did say he wanted Link to be more gender neutral, but what he's really saying is that he just wants men and women to see themselves in Link and relate to him. Not as some weird ideological reason, but because he's the main character and of course Nintendo wants their players, regardless of gender, to be able to connect to Link, even if they are men themselves. It's the same with Samus. She's a woman and that's totally fine. I don't need Samus to be lesbian or suddenly become a man in order for me to like her. But the difference here is you don't see straight people like myself advocating to claim female characters to become male. The reason being, of course, is because I'm sane and not terminally online and I'm comfortable with who I am as a person. And I don't need to see myself in everything I consume, but that's clearly not how game journalists see it. Obviously, video games as a medium are enjoyed by both men and women, and I've argued in the past many times that you don't need to see yourself in media in order to relate to a character. The obvious example I've used before is Spawn, who's a black man, and even though I'm a white man, I can still relate to him even though we look nothing alike. I just like Spawn because he looks cool. He doesn't need to look like me in order for me to like him or relate to him. Samus doesn't need to have the same downstairs for me to realize she's cool. And fans have also clapped back at places like the Gamer and Polygon with one user claiming, They didn't play any Legend of Zelda games besides Breath of the Wild, let them pretend like they usually do. This is funny as well because outside of Breath of the Wild and now Tears, Link largely cannot be altered physically for the most part when it comes to cosmetics until those games. Of course you could say Majora's Mask, but that's more a game mechanic than an actual transmog system in place. But the grasping for straws doesn't end there with the gamer yet again in the spotlight with an article from 2021 about Ratchet & Clank's Rift Apart titled, 
Kit, not Rivet, is Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart's trans icon. The yellow robot has a queer story to tell. They go on to say, and I quote, Genuine trans representation is hard to come by, so many trans icons in the popular trans zeitgeist are not canonically trans at all. Regardless of whether transness was in the mind of the writers, Rivet's narrative could still have lent credence to the Rivet is trans theory. Instead, she's upstaged by Kit, who clearly emerges as the game's true trans icon. You find Kid on Savali while playing as Ratchet. She's currently going by her original name, KT7461, and living with the monks. She's not entirely isolated here. She's on good terms with the monks, and working with them gives her some form of purpose. But it's still very clear that Kit is lonely, and as you get to know her more, it becomes apparent she is shutting herself off from the world. She considers herself broken, unlovable, and a burden, and so she stays out of everybody's way, never opening herself up to pain. This is unfortunately an all-too-common queer experience, but it's not the only way in which Kit embraces the trans narrative. One of Kit's biggest insecurities is her body. Her default form is rather genderless, although her voice, more curved shaped to Clank's blocky one, and the fact she goes by she, all establish Kit as female. However, she can transform into a warbot, a huge and bulky brute, hulking around the place and smashing everything with her large frame. With the height, wide shoulders, and thicker limbs, Kit becomes the oafish caricature many trans women view themselves as, especially when they compare themselves to cisgender women. Kit's name is important in all of this too. She goes from what is essentially her birth name in KT7461 to a more personal, chosen name in Kit. Anyone cis or trans is welcome to change their name, either by legal deed poll or just asking people to refer to you by a nickname. But it is a core part of the trans experience and cannot be ignored. It's particularly interesting that Ratchet suggests Katie after KT, and Kit rejects it in favor of a more gender-neutral moniker. Much like Rivet, I don't think Kit was written with this trans narrative in mind, but with Rivet, it's only skin deep. Aside from the fact that Rivet has a canonically inaccurate tale, one that dimensional rules can explain away in any case, she doesn't really fit the trans narrative. There's nothing thematic that really supports the claim one way or the other. There's nothing to disprove it, but you'd have to be looking for it to find it. With Kit, the trans themes unfold before you, end quote. The gamer kind of unravels their own point and basically proves what I've been saying this entire video. The end part there confirms it. There's nothing thematic that really supports the claim one way or the other. And they also openly admit that it's all virtue signaling with one part that says, Genuine trans representation is hard to come by, so many trans icons in the popular trans zeitgeist are not canonically trans at all. This, at its core, is the perfect description of how the gamer and Polygon claim Link is a gay or trans icon. They know deep down that he isn't, but they're so hell-bent on seeing representation in any way that they're willing to leap through logic to find it. In a lot of ways, it makes me more sad than anything. I feel bad for these people, really. I just think the journalists at Polygon, the gamer, and others need to understand that ultimately people are tired of this stuff. You don't win people over by pushing stuff in their face, if anything that's how you antagonize and radicalize them, which is what they're doing. If you want to win people over to your side, you have to do it with sane rational thinking and level-headed discussion. Look, it's not that I or other people don't want trans people to exist, although I'm sure there are people out there who say that. It's just that we're tired of constantly having these ideologies push in our faces 24-7 when all we want to do is play video games and relax. Link is not trans or gay, but I guess if I can find some middle ground, I think it's fine if gay or trans people find some inkling of commonality with Link. We're all just people looking to belong somewhere, so I fully understand why they're saying this. So, even though some may have thought this video would be full of hate, I like to think on this channel I always look deeper and really try to dissect the root cause of whatever I'm talking about. So while Link is obviously very clearly not gay or trans, and Kid from Ratchet can't be any gender because it's, well, a robot, I suppose if using Link as a beacon for positivity is what works, then that's fine. It's just annoying when ideologically driven movements, especially these days, try to transform every single thing to fit their viewpoint. It's okay if Link isn't gay or trans. It also doesn't mean he can't be liked by people who are different than him either. It's okay if he's liked by trans or gay people, but you have to understand that there needs to be a balance. Hopefully that makes sense. 
So what do you think? Is Link an allegory for trans or gay rights? Is it all nonsense? Let me know in the comments below. Obviously be respectful about it, and if you're new here, I just want you to know that anyone is welcome to talk freely here on my channel. So subscribe to see more stuff like this, like the video to help the channel out, and thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.